Yo, what up, polar bear? Help, I'm dissolving in water. Yo, bears ain't soluble in water. That's easy for you to say. You're not polar. Yo, that's right. Today we talking about factors affecting solubility. Hit the theme. Ain't nothing but a chem thing, baby. Too flipped out, teachers going crazy. Lancaster is a district that pays me. Unbreakable, so please don't try to break it. this. But uh, back to the lecture at hand. Hello and welcome to another episode of Shu Fu Chem in Action. I'm your host, Shu, and with me as always is Fu. What up, nerds? So Fu, in our last lesson, we focused on solubility, saturation, and how to use table G. Yeah, and in this lesson, we're gonna focus in on the speed or the rate at which a substance dissolves. So let's get started. Factors affecting solubility. A lesson from the solutions unit. Collision theory. In order for dissolving to occur, solute and solvent molecules must come in contact with one another. More specifically, an effective collision must occur. In an effective collision, solute and solvent molecules must collide with proper energy for dissolving to occur and proper orientation or proper angle. We're gonna use plane pool or billiards if you prefer as an analogy for collision theory. Let's say like in the picture, you're trying to sink the 15 ball in the side pocket. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that you're hitting it at the exact right angle so that it goes in. You're also gonna to wanna to make sure that you hit it hard enough with enough energy that it's gonna go in. And this is really similar to making a solution. You have your solute and your solvent, they gotta hit at the exact right angle with the right amount of energy for dissolving to occur. Factors affecting the dissolving rate. Any variable that increases the number of effective collisions will increase the speed of dissolving. Some of these factors not only increase the speed of dissolving, but increase the amount of solute that can be dissolved. So when discussing the factors affecting the dissolving rate, we're really talking about how fast or the speed at which a substance is dissolving. So rate and speed are the same thing. But we can also tie in time to that. So when we talk about how fast a substance is dissolving, it's inversely related to the time. So if we have a substance dissolving at a fast rate, we say that it takes less time. And if it's dissolving at a lower rate, it would take more time. Solid solutes, stirring. If the solvent is stirred while adding a solid solute, more frequent collisions occur. This increases the chance of an effective collision. Thus, as stirring increases, the rate of dissolving a solid increases. Solid solutes, temperature. If the temperature of the solvent is increased, the molecules are moving faster. As a result, when a solid solute is added, collisions occur more frequently and with more energy, increasing the chances of an effective collision. Thus, as temperature increases, the rate of dissolving a solid increases. Solid solutes, surface area. If a solid solute is crushed, then the surface area increases. Since more of the solute is exposed to the solvent, collisions occur more frequently, increasing the chances of an effective collision. Thus, as surface area increases, the rate of dissolving a solid increases. To summarize, if you want to increase the rate of dissolving a solid solute, stir it up, heat it up, crush it up. You try number one. Use the reading passage and the data to answer the three questions found on the following slide. Gaseous solutes, temperature. If the temperature of the solvent is increased, the molecules are moving faster. However, gaseous solutes now have energy to leave or remain out of the solution, aqueous to gas. Thus, as temperature increases, the rate of dissolving a gas decreases. So be careful. When we increase the temperature of a solvent and add a solid, there's actually more collisions and the rate goes up but it's actually the opposite trend for a gas. When you heat up a solvent and add a gas, that gas now has energy to leave the solution. We don't really talk about collisions here and the solubility goes down. Gaseous solutes, pressure. If the pressure on a gaseous solute is increased, the molecules are pushed together toward the solvent. The number of collisions between the gaseous solute and solvent surface increases in frequency, increasing the chances of an effective collision. Thus, as pressure increases, the rate of dissolving a gas increases. So taking a look at the picture, we've got two containers with two movable pistons, 
And the one on the left, we have that piston all the way up, so the pressure is pretty low. As we push that piston down, the pressure begins to build up in that air above the liquid surface, and that pressure is forcing that gas to collide with the surface more often, making it more soluble because you get more effective collisions. Now, it's important to note here that pressure only affects gases. It has no effect on solids at all. To summarize, if you want to increase the rate of dissolving a gaseous solute, cool it down, keep it pressurized. Think of keeping your carbonated beverage carbonated. All right, so when thinking about those factors that affect gaseous solubility, please remember your pop or soda, if you prefer, or carbonated beverage, whichever you prefer. You don't want to keep your pop outside of the refrigerator because then it's warm and it gets really fizzy quick and you lose that fizz. You want to keep it cool. Put it in the refrigerator, right? Cool it down. That keeps the gas inside your pop. You also want to keep the cap on it, right? So if you take the cap off, the pressure gets to be released and the pressure is low. So the gas comes out of solution. So keep that cap on to keep the pressure high. You try number two. Which of the following conditions of 100 milliliters of water will have the lowest solubility of oxygen? Explain how you know. I'll give you a little hint. This is gonna be the opposite of keeping your carbonated beverage carbonated. Polarity and solubility. Solutes with similar polarities as their solvent tend to be soluble. Like dissolves like. This is a great way to remember this concept. Polar solvents, like water, dissolve polar solutes and ionic compounds. Now, ionic compounds aren't polar, but they're fully charged. Nonpolar solvents, like organic solvents, dissolve nonpolar solutes. This goes back to intermolecular attractions. Polar molecules with dipole-dipole attractions strongly attract other polar molecules. Nonpolar molecules with weak or London dispersion attractions attract other nonpolar molecules. Some solvents, like alcohols, are slightly polar, and they're able to dissolve both polar and nonpolar solutes. Alcohols can dissolve in both polar and nonpolar solvents, too. Alcohols are not polar enough to dissolve ionic compounds, however. So water is really, really polar, and it's strong enough to rip apart that crystal lattice that's found in an ionic compound. However, alcohols are only slightly polar, so they're not strong enough to rip apart that crystal lattice, and that's why ionic compounds don't dissolve in alcohols. Oh, I get it, because he's a polar bear. Okay, we're gonna do an example to illustrate the concept of like dissolves like. You ready, Fu? I am. Would ammonia gas, NH3 gas, be more soluble in water or the organic solvent toluene? Justify your answer. Okay, so let's start with our solvents, Fu. What are the solvents listed in the problem? All right, the solvents look like we've got water and toluene. All right, now let's look at their polarities. What would the polarity of water be? So water or H2O is uh, definitely polar. Yeah, we've heard that many times before. With its bent shape, it's asymmetrical and polar. What about the other solvent listed? Uh, toluene. I have no idea what toluene is, but it does say that it's an organic solvent, and organic solvents are nonpolar. Very good. Way to use the clues in the question to deduce that toluene is a nonpolar solvent. All right, now let's take a deeper look at ammonia. We want to actually figure out if ammonia is polar or nonpolar, and I think it would help if we did a Lewis structure for NH3. Okay, so ammonia is NH3. That's five valence electrons and one each for the hydrogens, a total of eight. Good. So you'd end up getting a structure that looks like this. All right, now that we have the Lewis structure, let's look at the symmetry, because that's going to help us figure out if it's a polar or nonpolar molecule. So does this look the same on all sides? Does it look different? What do you think in terms of the symmetry? Um, it's looking asymmetrical to me, because I have this lone pair of electrons on top, uh, making it a trigonal pyramidal shape. All right, very good. So if we're asymmetrical, are we polar or are we nonpolar? Oh, snap. This is asymmetrical, so therefore it's polar. Very good. Now we can make our final conclusion about 
Would ammonia gas be more soluble in water or toluene? What do you think? Well, like dissolves like, right? So yep. ammonia is polar, water is polar, so it must be more soluble in water. That is correct. Let's finalize our answer right here. Very good. You try number three. Is methane gas, CH4 gas, more soluble in water or the organic solvent, benzene? Justify your answer. Be sure to label the polarities of the two solvents and draw Lewis structure for the methane. When we describe the solubilities of liquid solutes, we use the following terms. Missible, the two liquids mix evenly or they're homogeneous, or immiscible, the two liquids do not mix. They separate over time. This would be heterogeneous. If we take a look at the picture below, we see that water and methylene form two separate layers. This must mean that they don't have similar polarities. We know water's polar, and that implies methylene must be nonpolar. We say the two liquids are immiscible. Over on the right, we have what looks homogeneous. We don't see any layers. Acetone and water mix. That must imply that acetone and water are both polar. We say the two liquids are miscible. You try number four. Answer the following two questions. Are vegetable oil and water miscible or immiscible? How do you know? What does this imply about the polarity of vegetable oil? Well, that's gonna do it for today's episode on factors affecting solubility. Later, nerds. Hello and welcome to another episode of Shufu Keminacha. I'm your host, Shu, and with me as always is, I almost said What up, nerds? In order for dissolving to, ooh, Collision yes, theory, thank yeah. you, thank, thanks, bro. I was waiting for that to happen. We're going to use, let me try it again. We're gonna use pool, or billiards, or billiards, or billiards, or billiards, or billiards, if you prefer, as an analogy, and an analogy, I'm just gonna keep going or billiards if you prefer, or billiards if you prefer, or billiards, or billiards, or billiards, or billiards, or billiards if you prefer, as an analogy for collision theory. Billiards. Are you trying to keep filming right now or are you trying to cut it? It's the side pocket. Side pocket. Side pocket. Side pocket. You're also going to make it. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> You're also going to make sure guana, <laughs> guana. That's what right. she said. <laughs> <laughs> No. <laughs> <clears throat> Read the words. Reading is hard. Word. <clears throat> I struggle with words sometimes. Today's episode is brought to you by Colon Blow. But we never off, but we zone to the brick of dawn. S E I E N C E in the hall, they call S Wing. You know we never wear a tie like my homies, boys, two men. It's so hard to say goodbye. Like, like this, that. This and uh, it's like that and like this and like that and uh, it's like this. You're going in low power mode. Plug in chill to the next episode.